Good afternoon and welcome into the take up. Today we have episode 149, Shading and Embroidery Digitizing or Working In. Greetings, everybody. Welcome into the take up. It's great to have you here on this wonderful afternoon. Uh, glad to be talking about some digitizing, some technical stuff, some things that people have been asking me about uh, elaborating on. And though, honestly, it seems like a complicated topic, I think it's fair to say that this is something that's not uh, necessarily that difficult to discuss. I think that it should be kind of a, an easy conversational show. And I know that sounds like really, Eric, you always say it's going to be short and conversational and easy. But in all honesty, I think that this is something we can kind of show, discuss, I'll walk you through some designs, and we'll get to the meat of this topic pretty easily. Uh, because honestly, working in is just about being cognizant of the stitches that you're working on or on top of. It's about layering. So when we're talking about shading and detail and the way we work, uh, really what I'm talking about here is how we are layering, how we are working into the existing stitches. And there's some differences between in, on, and under. There's some differences between all these different ways that we might handle them. And I'll just walk you through some designs. There'll be some designs you've seen before and some designs you may have not seen before from me where I discuss and kind of walk you through the parts and pieces of how they went together. And I think that's the thing. In this case, rather than belabor this with a tremendous amount of detail or theory, I think I'm just going to show you some things. We'll talk about the different ways we might get into shading and gradients, and we'll just kind of get into it. So like I said, this is a fairly simple topic, if you ask me. It's something that, uh, unfortunately, the one thing that will bother people is when we look at any kind of gradients, shading, or working in details, there will be people who feel like, hey, isn't there a tool that just does this for me? Isn't there a way that I don't have to do this manually or draw as many points or work into this piece as much as it's sh you're showing me right now, especially as I start to show you manual work that I do? But invariably, I have to stop and say, no, not necessarily. That said, we're going to talk both about using fill stitches, fill stitches and other stitch types to work in to shade existing pieces. And we're going to talk about some manual stitches as well. And in all honesty, the theory behind it, the concept of working in, as I put my scare quotes on it, really shouldn't be that hard to expand to any other kinds of stitches you're working on. It's really a fairly simple tactic to think about the layers underneath and what you're building from the foundation up. As you guys know, I tend to like to work elementally. If you build the foundations of what you understand is going on physically with the embroidery, and remember we have thread, we have literal threads that are on the surface of the design. We have threads that are poking through the design like wedges. We have threads that are laying on top of other threads either filtering into them because they're at the same angle or laying on top of them because something's below. We have loops of real material thread that are pulling down under tension in the garment, through the garment, on top of and into existing stitching that's there. If we start with that in our minds, if we stop thinking about the screen, if we stop thinking about little colored lines that are present on the screen and start thinking about physical threads that are being pulled down under tension into our designs, I think this is actually fairly easy to grasp. That said, I am going to show you some methods of drawing. I'm going to show you kind of how I put some things together and just walk you through some designs and show you where it comes together, where it falls apart, and what I was thinking for these pieces and how I put them together. And like I said, a variable amount of these are going on. We may not go for the massive full hour, hour and a half. This might just be something where we have this discussion and talk about it. And honestly, I'd like to hear more from you. If you have questions, you have comments, you have things you want to see from me while we're doing this, feel free to disrupt this. This really falls on people having watched some previous sessions where I talked about configuring stitch types. If you go back a couple sessions, I talked about the different things that we can configure about individual stitch types. And when they watched those designs run, when I talked about them, I had follow-up questions where people were saying, hey, how did you do this? What kind of thing would you do for shading? How was this gradient built? How did you make these choices about how you did these pieces? And certainly some of it is just, I'm looking at the art underneath the piece and making some judgment calls. Some of that just comes with practice, but I can at least show you how the stitches are put together and why I tend to put stitches down in the angles they are, in the layers they are, at the densities they are. And we can talk about that as a, as a way to kind of open up the concept of shading, the concept of 
working into the stitches. But let's go ahead and say hi to some folks. I know not everybody loves us. You're on Replay Squad. You get to skip it if you like. But for you folks who are live, I always like to say hi to everybody who comes in live to watch. We have Cindy King in Texas saying, good, very, very windy afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, Cindy. We have Gail coming in saying hi to everybody. <laughs> We're saying hi to each other, which I love. Frank, who is an awesome community supporter, thank you for always uh, sharing and helping and being a part of what gets that education out there, my friend. So thank you about that. Sunrise Tactical is checking in from Washington State. Happy to have you here, Sunrise Tactical. We also have Ramona checking in from the, for the afternoon. Ramona doing awesome work herself and digitizing, so she knows a lot about this stuff already. Uh, Woody saying, hello and thank you, Eric. I'll be listening and we'll try to get my other head running. Busy, busy hat weekend. Boy, do I understand how that works. Uh, lots of folks working on technical stuff these days. What I'll say is you may have to come back and see some of this visually, but I'll certainly keep talking about it. You know, I have enough words to say about any of these things. Sugar Dose coming in saying hi. Hi, Sugar. And uh, we have people saying hi from all over the place. We've got North Central Minnesota. This Barb is checking in from Minnesota Custom Made. Hello. Happy to have you in. People saying hi to each other. Love that. Lisa Shaw, awesome educator and uh, my compatriot and brilliance in her own right and her own work at uh, Bubbles Menagerie. You have to go check out her stuff. Um, awesome to see you here. Good afternoon, Lisa. And we have Sally saying hi. We have David saying hi. We have Vet saying hi. Everybody is in, and I'm happy to have you guys here. Like I said, if you're on the hashtag replay squad, still happy to have you here too. Feel free to ask questions. Feel free to jump into the comments. Uh, not all of them get answered immediately, but I do certainly try and come back and answer every comment that I can. All right, with that, let's kind of get into this thing. What am I talking about when I say working in? I know it sounds goofy. I'm always coining a new term for what I'm talking about. But the thing is, you know, when we're dealing with shading or detail, the one thing I want to get clear is people think of shading, they think of detail, they think of gradients uh, as if we were painting, as if we had painting or ink or some way that we can blend. But the only kind of blending that can happen with thread, remember, is for threads to be next to each other. That is the only kind of blending we have. We have an individual line. Uh, okay, don't get me wrong. In the age of color reel, I always have to give the <laughs> extra statement that unless you are working on a color reel and it has very distinct limitations, go back to the episodes about color reel to find out more. Unless you're dyeing your thread on the fly, Every stitch you have is a single line from point to point of a single color. And we have to remember that these are physical objects. These are threads. They are not some other magical thing that blends. They do not smear. They do not uh, shade together. They can't be fuzzed out aside from maybe some wool blend threads. And even then, we're not talking about smooth color gradient, smooth color blending. When we are blending, when we are shading, what we are really doing is working much more like you would with, with ink or with... Um, or honestly, if you were sitting there laying out individual colored blocks, it's more like mosaic. It's more like anything where we have physical objects. The threads are either laying next to each other and each thread is a color. <laughs> it is a color unless we have some other color mitigation happening. And the only way we can adjust how much of each color is in any given area is how close together those threads are and how many threads in a given area are present. So whether we're talking about shading like line shading or we're talking about uh, color variants, like I said, gradients, it's really the same question. So even though I can talk about line shading versus color, we can talk about the difference between uh, something that is engraving style shading versus layering in colors. Because thread is limited to essentially being stitches and stitches are straight lines from point to point of a solid color, you're really doing the same thing and it really just depends on how many color uh, selections you are employing in this. Uh, it, when we're talking about gradient style shading, we're using multiple color threads to build up to densities and we are getting multiple colors through this interleaving of uh, threads of colors. Whereas if we're talking about something that's more engraving style, if we're talking about just shading or line value shading, then what we're usually doing is a single color and we are using that single color and the closeness of the lines to create value. How close together they are is how dark that color is, how far apart they are is how light it is. However, whenever we're looking at one line of thread next to something that it is on top of, it is always that solid color. It doesn't vary. So we will have that same contrast when we spread things apart. The contrast between the color behind it or the color next to it and the color that we're stitching in is going to be a fixed thing. We don't really get to change that. So I can talk about shading and talk about detail, but invariably what I'm really talking about is placing stitches next to each other. It's the only thing we have that we can really do 
for embroidery. So it's just something to remember. You are always working in that fashion. Whether or not you think you are, you always are working in that fashion. I'm going to say hi to a couple more people. Number one, uh, we have uh, Lisa saying, yay for the replay squad. Education doesn't have a time limit. Absolutely. And I love to think these things are evergreen. Uh, episodes 12 and 13 of this show where I talked about my initial patch making concepts are probably the most popular out of the entire stack. So these shows go on forever. We also have Joe Rita checking in from Austin, Texas, and Lisa saying, I knew you'd be watching Joe Rita with all of your experimentation in this area. Absolutely. Shading is just something that takes experimentation, even from people who've been doing it for a long time. Whenever I go to work on gradients, work on shading, there is a little bit of discussion. There is a little bit of work. There are swatch tests. There are tests of color to make sure colors are right. And even to the point of which color is on top. Do I use my mid-tone on top, my highlight on top? I often will use a mid-tone on top instead of a highlight in a gradient because I'm trying to tie together the darker and lighter colors. And even though they are offset, so they should be just right next to each other, there is a slight difference between which one's on top and which one's on the bottom sometimes, depending on how your densities run. So testing is just the name of the game when we're doing stuff that's supposed to be very fine detail work or very fine shading work. If we're doing gradients, we know gradients always take a little bit of extra work. So it's just something we kind of have to get used to. Um, honestly, I don't think it's surprising to anybody that's the case, but that's just how it's going to be. We have to understand that there's some testing involved and we have to understand that we have kind of the same questions that we would always have between these different things we're dealing with. It's always going to be a matter of what we can get done with what we're trying to achieve in these blends. Now, like I said, we're going to talk about these different pieces. First of all, let me go back to the original thumbnail for this. You can see that I'm showing you the Busket El Apache piece that I often show. And I think that this one is a fair one to start on because it's very small. Number one, it has a very small area in the center where the detail is located. And I think it's something that is worth checking out. I've got several pieces that I'm going to show you, but I show you this piece because it specifically has some good illustrations. Now, we'll go ahead and add this to the stream. Let's bring this up and take a look at it. Now, you guys have seen this piece many times before. The things that I'm going to call out to you that are interesting about the piece in my mind are that we have this shading in multiple different variations, right? Can't see it great up here, but we have these white clouds that are done with a couple different pieces. We've got an accordion fill and some manual stitching being used to fill these in. Got kind of some weird visual artifacts from the uh, video supply. So sorry about having those weird uh, extra arrows that are on here. I'll try and trace as best I can so you can see them. Um, but we also have the shading that's done in the tree. So we have those leaves and we have a couple of different colors that are in the back of the, that tree to create that kind of autumn color that we have there. We also have the grass, which is actually made up of vertical fills. It has no manual stitching in it. So the grass that's in the front is actually a collection of three vertical fills with settings attached to them. And if we look at the mountain, the mountain is actually made of curved fills, but then has manual fill style shading done to it, as well as some manual shading that's done as, as part of that fill style shading. Remember, even if we're using a manual tool, uh, we can always create whatever we want with that manual stitch tool, meaning that you may create something that is very fill-like with it. Now that I've got pointer focus on, that's helping us keep those weird pointers away. But we can see that we've got that fill style shading that works in, and we'll talk about that again. We've got like I said, the multiple fills that are put together to make this part. We have some shading in the uh, crane as well, and we can't see it as well here, but I'll show it to you in the digital. We've got some shading in the clouds that is used to increase kind of which areas are more dense in the cloud cover across in front of that blue. We have this light layer of clouds. So there's a bunch of different shading in here. And like I said, there are multiple pieces we're going to talk about. Um, certainly when we're talking about some shading, and this is where I'm not going to discuss it a ton. This is another piece for Buscadil Apache. This is the Craniac hats that they did. When we're talking about fully graphical style shading, yes, this is shading these shadows, but this is just solid stitching. There is nothing about this that's very difficult to do. It's just a block of solid color. So I really don't have to cover it, but I will just say that's still shading. Uh, but what we're talking about here today is when we're doing things that are more varied. I've showed you guys this piece here from uh, from this jacket patch here. I won't tell you the name of the people. Once again, I try and leave their names out of it. We have this piece from Dirty Dukes that's up in the corner. We'll talk about that one again. Um, this is another one people often like. It's the We have radial gradients being done inside of each of these honeycombs for the Rhodesian Ridgeback Club of the United States, and that's a patch piece that I did some years ago. But that piece has some radial gradients, and this one's all done with fill stitches once again. So there's all these different ways we can achieve them. 
But in all these pieces, we have the super stripey here. All of this is done with fill stitching. There's no manual shading to create this gradient or the shading that's done in the background. And we can see multiple pieces of the jumping mouse that I've shown you a million times. There's another new one that I haven't shown a lot, which is the uh, super chapter meet. And this one's pretty interesting as well. We've got another piece for that we can see. And CRS chapter meet has some interesting shading here. It's a small left chest. So this is actually a, a fairly small logo. This text over here is, you know, five millimeter text that's down at the bottom. And you can see what looks like a pretty rough weave is actually just a, a pretty simple twill shirt. So it's not actually all that rough. It's a very smooth shirt. This is a very small design. But if we look at all these different textures, we have our quail here too. And the quail has lots of manual work because of all these directional type of fills. But even the things that look like they're manual up in the top of this crest, those are actually done with contour stitching. The thing to realize is the way we place stitches, whether we're using a fill stitch, whether we're using a manual stitch, whatever tool we're using is somewhat immaterial to how we place them. It's all about getting the stitches where we want them to be. It has very little to do with the tool or in as much as we can get those stitches there any way we want to. The tool we use is about how much control we wanna have, how quickly we need to work, and what's gonna make sense for the final outcome. Some of these pieces have to be done manually. Some of the stuff that I showed you, manual stitching is really the only way it's gonna work the best, but you can achieve quite a lot with very little, with using mostly fill stitch types or using mostly satins if we're trying to uh, do some shading that's on a satin, even though I will say that satins don't blend very well because of the angular return stitches. The thing is, we just need to think about what's already there and what we're trying to build to and achieve. So yes, we're talking about shading. Yes, to degree, we're talking about detail, but the thing to remember really is this concept of working in. So what do I mean when I say working in? What I mean is, as we are building layers of stitches, we make sure that we leave these stitches that we're working into, the base layer of stitches, visible on screen, and we work into them, being cognizant of the angles of the stitches and the densities of the stitches that are already there. What does this mean? When we have space, we can work density into the existing spaces. This means that if we have a base layer of stitching, we're trying to get a target density that is nice, has a nice hand, feels good on the garment, is not the super dense potato chip bulletproof uh, body armor that we can make if we put too many stitches together. If we're trying to work on that, then what we need to do is make sure that our, our lower layers have space for the stitching above them. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes we're going to go above our target density, especially if we want to get really nice coverage and only have a little bit of shading. That is totally fine. A little bit of accordion shading on top of a fully filled piece is not a deal breaker. However, we want to make space for things. And then we want to think about what happens when we start to stitch into the design. And here's kind of the question you have to ask yourself. Am I stitching in to the existing stitching or on to the stitching? And this is just a very physical reality. If we are trying to make things blend, if we are trying to make them recede, blend, be part of the existing stitches that are there, they should be in the same angle. If there is a horizontal fill and I want something to blend into it so it's not very obvious, or at least that it looks like part of the existing fill, even if I'm using a different color that I'm trying to kind of integrate, if I'm trying to shade gradually and gently, then I want them to be at the same angle because at the same angle, they fall together. Otherwise, the bottom layer, if we're at a different angle, works like underlay and it holds up the top. That's not always undesirable. If we want something to sit on top of the existing piece, we don't want to see any breakage of the lines, we don't want to see anything sinking, then we either have to support it or we have to change the angle so it sits on top. It's in versus on. So working into an existing fill, working into an existing satin stitch is shading being cognizant of those angles and if we want to blend if we want it to be subtle working those stitches into the existing angle of the stitches that are underneath it like i said this is a fairly simple concept working on something is essentially where we're trying to change that angle so that the bottom stitches are holding up our top stitches so that they sit on top of the existing stitch points or the existing stitches that are there and like an underlay they don't sink at all the thing is, we sometimes can't avoid this change when we're traveling. As you know, every line of fill has a return, has an end where it has to drop down to the next row. When it does that, it will be on top of the existing stitching. 
We can mitigate that by lengthening the angle of the return a little bit. We can work on that angle in order to make it softer, but it will be visible. And so we have to think about that. The other thing to remember with working into a design is that we know that longer stitches tend to stand up, tend to be higher. They have a little less tension on them and they tend to be more lofty in the design. So if we start putting shorter stitches in for our shading, we should assume that they're going to tighten up a little further and fall back if they're in the same angle. And we may have them suck right down into the existing fill, especially if we have a fair amount of density on that base fill. So we just need to think about the physical nature of what's already there. That's really the case, right? Whether it's blending, whether it's gradients, it's all about layering and understanding what's going on with that, like I said, in versus on. And I'm also gonna say this, when we're thinking about working into some existing stitches, the other thing we have to think about, especially when we're talking about like manual stitching in detail and edge quality, which I'll show you later, is it's actually in, on, and under. Meaning there are times when we want to work under a piece on purpose. And that doesn't mean that uh, we're really changing this because really working in is the same thing if I have something larger that's on top of something. The thing is usually when you're working shading in, it's shading the smaller object, the, the sparser object working into the larger filled area. Whereas we can also work under, we can specifically leave space for things to show through on top, or we can work under the edge of something under a junction in order to specifically either reinforce it in a technical way or to break up the edge. And I'll talk about that later with shading. We'll talk about our little mouse friend that we've shown many times to kind of explain that too. But yeah, it's in, on, and under. It's about both blending and gradients. I think they are very similar. And also shading of any kind. Shading is very similar to a gradient. It's just about... Uh, openness, it's about smoothness, it's about the number of colors we use to achieve it. So we'll go ahead and see, let's see if anybody else, uh, we have somebody saying so there's some sound issues. If you're having sound issues, let me know. Um, so far, I don't think that I'm having any others. If you can hear me, then let me know. If you can't hear me, go ahead and say so. Otherwise, everything's checking out on my end. But yeah, lots of other folks who are chiming in and saying hi, but I think the thing is, we need to just get into seeing some designs, right? So number one, we talked about our Buscadilla patch design. Let's bring it up on screen just for a second. So this is our screen we talked about. This is our Buscadilla patchy design. And this one I bring in once again, because we've got all that detail. We have all the different kinds of shading going on over here. We've got our backgrounds, we've got our mountain, we've got our sky, we have our grass, and we have our happy little tree to paraphrase our friend, Bob Ross. We have all these wonderful things that we can kind of refer to. So let's go ahead and start with this design. I have tons more. Like I showed you before, I have all of these designs and some more that I also may get into as we talk about this stuff. But uh, let's go ahead and start with our friend, the Busca Apache design, because it has so much going on in it. And because I can go ahead and give you guys some other pieces to work from. Now, Yes, like you see, I have some other things to look at, but we'll go ahead and get to our Buscula patch design. And it's got some explainer stuff around it. We've seen this image before, but let's go ahead and look at the entire thing and how it's built. So here's our piece. And we can see some jumps and some other stuff that are artifacts from the digital file here. But I'm going to go ahead and just spool you through the piece a little bit before we explain it. If we look at the top, we've got a nice curved fill that's the base of the sky. And now we can start to see this piece. And in fact, if you look at this, this is actually built under. So this is working in, but it's under. And in fact, this is a case where I actually changed the sequence of this piece and, and worked this piece under the extra density. The manual stitching is worked under the fill that eventually ended up in this piece. And by the way, thank you for everybody checking on sound. Looks like everybody's doing good here. Must be local to whoever's having trouble. So by the way, check in, it might be local for you. If everybody else is here, check this out. This was built in this fashion. If we look at how this guy is built, I've actually done this work. And what I'm gonna tell you is, I digitized this portion here right now. Uh, this detail work was actually digitized after what you're gonna see next, which is this fill. So what's actually being built up here are two different pieces. We have a piece that is a, a gradient fill or an accordion fill with a multi-node curve on it. I'm gonna show you more about something like this in a second. And what I did first was create that fill and then I did this shading and we can see that shading again here. I didn't create it in this order. I created my fill first and said, all right, I like how the fill is going, but I have some clouds and I want to make some variable density in this cloud cover in this kind of misty cloudy layer. And so I went back in and manually punched. And if we zoom right in, I'll zoom super far in so we can see it. We've got these lines that are punched in between the existing lines. A little hard to see on this color combination, but we'll go ahead and leave it on 3D so you can see it. 
lines are punched in between those existing lines of the fill. I'm working in, and I mean in a very real way when I'm digitizing, I'm working into the existing fill. So we can see how those lines all line up so that some areas have a higher density than other areas in that fill. And that's done by manually punching those pieces in. Now I'm gonna say you can do it with multiple stitch types. You can also do this with fills, but because I wanted a great amount of variance between these different pieces, I went ahead and punched these in manually. And I'm actually gonna show you these in objects later, but we'll go ahead and let's zoom back out a little bit and we'll run this piece through so you can see the rest of it, not rather than just explain it all at one piece. But it does kind of show you this concept of in, on, or under. This is still working in if you ask me, but I sequenced it in such a way that this detail was done underneath the main fill. And that often uh, lends to a smoother surface texture because it kind of hides those transitional stitches. Like I always say, when we're on a fill stitch, Edge to edge, it's normal that I'm, I'm going to have these little chisel tips, these tra uh, transits to the next row. But under here, you can see that some of the jumps to the next row are pretty visible. Sometimes having those on the underneath row can make them look a little better, a little smoother. But let's go ahead and go on with the rest of this. We now have the base of the mountain done with two uh, curved fills here. But once again, you see now I'm working in again, working in and a little bit of working on. But what you can see what I'm doing is I've got shading again that is worked into the angle of the fills. Here's the nominal angle of these fills. And actually these are not curved, these are straight fills. Uh, and I'm working my shading into that same angle so that it is a little subtle. In fact, if we go back to the image, we'll go this up so I can then swing back and forth between it. If we zoom in on this piece, you can see how they fall together. You can see here as well, how it, some of them look a little thinner, a little thicker. They fall together, they don't look like it's really extreme. They end up in that same angle and we get this nice little interleaved, mixed, blended kind of look to that piece. So if we look at that and we go back to the original, we can look into how we are working in to the same angle of the stitching that's there. And what we do is we work in for most of it. And then once we, if we wanna have a little bit more uh, contrast, once in a while, you'll see there's a couple of passes here that go across the angle. These go across the angle, and then some of these passes are in the angle. They're in the same angle. And when we look at the actual piece, you'll see there's some area where the blends fall in a little bit more up here. We see a little bit more of that lighter blue. And down here where it's darker in those lines, why is that darker and lighter? Because if we go back and look here again, we can see that most of these are falling directly in the same angle as the rest of the fill. But then we have a few that are set opposite just a little bit. And if we want to talk about working on in a more in a more kind of detailed fashion, once we get over here, we've got some areas that are, I'm outlining areas and outlining the edge of the piece, and they're worked on top of it outside of the angle of the fill. However, the rest of these to keep them nice and subtle and make them blend in, we are working mostly in the angle. Though you'll also see that these get fairly dense here. We have a fair amount of density in this uh, base piece, but when I want a little more density, a little more darkness in the piece, I'm just adjusting how how far apart I'm drawing those lines. Like I said, the real concept here again is working in. I'm working into the angle of the fill where I want it to be uh, subtle, where I want it to blend, and where I don't want it to blend, where I want some outlines, where I want something that's a little more stark, then I'm gonna work against that angle. And of course, there's also just travel stitches. And most of the time I'm trying to hide my transits uh, where I have to travel from something in an area where I want an outline, where I want some of that definition. And I'm also just transiting uh, directly to outlining because I can, because I've got that nice dark outline that I wanted at the top of the ridge anyway, I can jump out and use that to travel between the pieces. So as we can see, we're working in, we're working into those angles. Uh, same thing on our friend, the tree here, we've got some similar stuff going on with working in. Let's go ahead and go back to the uh, digital file. We'll zoom that back out a little bit. I know I jump around and zoom a little bit much. Do forgive me if I make you a little motion sick. We'll go back in and look at the way the tree is built. So we've built up all this background and we'll we'll deal with the uh, grass here in a second. See the grass is just two vertical fills on top of a third light vertical fill that provides the base. We'll talk about how that's built. Then tree, we have a half density fill in the burgundy color, a half density fill offset, both of them with random stitch penetrations in that nice orange color. The branches, and the trunks done in black. And then we have a manual fill that is worked both into the design, worked into the angles, and sometimes worked on the angles against that the angles of the design. 
so as to make a little bit more randomness and a leaf-like pattern. Some of them fall in and some of them stand up tall. And because it's a nice golden shiny color, we end up with uh, nice deep penetration points on the lines. And those things either sink or float up to the top, depending on how they're laying on that angle. So we can see that's just how it's put together. We're working in, we're working on. And part of that is when I'm working on that piece, I'm viewing the existing stitching. I leave the existing stitching on screen so that when I'm working, I usually have my, my graphic behind me too that's, that's faded out. And I'm looking at this piece and saying, all right, I'm working into and on that existing angle. But when there are places that I want to start to break up the lines of the fill and where I want different looks, then I can do this very worm-like stitch that trails back and forth. Or you see, I wanted to have a couple little leaves that stuck out of the top. What do I have? I have a couple little stitches that just stick out of the top here and allow for some breakage in the edge. It breaks up the edge of that fill. We have those different turning stitches that over here, we can see they work against the fill that's existing. We have against that angle, but down here into this portion uh, closer to these branches, we have some that work with the angle. And the switching back and forth between those two angles means that we get this varied look where sometimes it's blending in and sometimes it's sticking out and it makes it look like leaves that are at different layers of the tree. So like I said, we're working in, we're working on, and it's all about just understanding what's underneath the existing pieces. And so I thought I would show you more of that. I mean, you can see there's some of it going on in the uh, crane as well, though we've got some random jump stitches loose and definitely the colors here are a little too stark. As we're into the satin stitches, we're working these lovely open zigzags to make the tips of the feathers darker. And you can see that, and we're on that leading edge of the wing, we've got a nice uh, satin that's over here. Well, I'm shading that with a zigzag that follows as best it can on the satin. Will they blend in entirely? No. Uh, every other stitch that's in that zigzag though, you will see lines up so that we get a little bit of softness to it. And you can see that even in this little bitty, bitty tiny shading that's happening uh, in the shoulder of the bird, right kind of under the wing, this is worked in to the angle of the fill. So I'm following the curvature of the fill as I punch these manually. You can see that, and I've kind of broken it out here in a couple different ways where we can see the individual pieces from the original piece, but I also recreated a couple of them so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, over here in this case, this is how it would be worked on instead of under. And this is the thing, when I first started this piece out, I've got my initial background. We can see that piece as it was created. And this was done natively in Stitch Artist. So you can actually see settings on this one. I went full density on it because I wasn't too worried with this very light density shading under here. And on a patch, you know, four to 4.5 would be a fine density for that background. Uh, in this case, I, I have it at four, but I think I'd probably lower it out to 4.2, 4.5 if I were going to put this onto a nice piece of patch material. It could probably even go lesser than that. But in the case of doing this initial piece, I uh, was working on different colors of patch material. And I wasn't sure about how much, um, how much density I would need. So I was copying the original piece that I had over here. But what we can see is, once again, we're talking about that working in. This is that same kind of style. We have a fill stitch here, and then we have a run stitch on top. I want you to be, actually be able to see the points. The initial fill that's here, we actually have a couple different run stitches. Let me grab all of those instead of just grabbing the one. Um, if we get over here, we've got these multiple blocks of run. doesn't matter how many blocks we have because these all actually connect. It's all one piece of thread without any trimming. But we have multiple blocks of run that were digitized in order to make that happen. You can always stop and start a block of run. But what I want you to see is this. The initial work that was done here to get that shading is essentially just a nice fill stitch. This is a fill stitch starting down here, going up to the top. You can adjust it to try and get more or less edge travel. In this case, I do have travel edge so that we have nice parallel edges. So if you turn off the travel edge, the two things that will happen is uh, you're going to get travels that are on the inside and you might get uh, these kind of chisel tips. So depending on the software and how it's, uh, how it's pathing, how it's kind of getting from one side to the next, what you end up with is some of this travel underneath. In the case of this piece, I probably could have left it like this. It would be fine. Uh, in the interest of kind of showing you the process, I think it's fine to go ahead and do travel edge, especially when uh, the edges are largely going to be hidden over here and over here by other objects. And then you can see what these runs are on top. And what I essentially did was go into this piece. Uh, in the original piece, I had some photography of clouds behind here that I looked at. I had actually, I actually made a composite. This original design, isn't a photograph of something happening. It's three photographs. It's a photograph of the grassy area with the tree. It's a photograph of the bird in flight. And there's a sky that I added together. So um, in the original piece, it's actually not one photographic sample that I'm working from. It's actually a composite collage that I then kind of put together to make this final design. But as we get into this piece, I just want to show you that the initial thing is just an accordion fill. 
So what do I mean by that? It's a it's a gradient fill. It's the kind of fill that we're used to seeing people use for blending. Uh, it goes down to about, and we'll have, we can actually check settings on this. It's about 2.2 mil density. So, uh, you know, 2.2 at the farthest end, and then it goes down further into this uh, descending density from this openness here to a tighter density up at the top. So we're using that gradient. We know we're doing a gradient style density in this in this entire piece. I think it's 2.2. Let me check that out again. So I think I selected the wrong one. Yeah, 2.2 decreasing density. So we've got that accordion fill that we're using for this base section. The rest of it then is done through adding those run stitches. So if we back that up and put our run stitches back in, we can kind of see how this is put together. I'll just show it to you one more time. We'll get out to where this one is. And we can see we've got our background done just as we did before. But as we've worked in our fill, then you can see that I manually punched in these areas in between the lines that are existing on the piece. So I really was working in. And the thing to see about this is not only am I working in between the lines by punching these manual straight stitches, and we can kind of trace how those go, but in areas where I wanted even more intense density, I had this little area that I wanted a really bright highlight over in this corner. We can actually see that I worked in twice in multiple layers, much like you would do with gradients. So I've worked in once. I have another layer that I worked in through this piece, some of it denser and some of it looser. And then as I came back to the top here, I decided to work in between these lines one more time and create a fairly high density up here at the top. And that's something that you can do. You can decide how much density just by working in multiple layers or like I did over in this piece in the center. It's harder to see here on the screen colors, but we can see with this piece that um, when I worked in this initial run after the fill, that we have multiple lines in between where I have this nice open gap. I looked at my overall densities and I actually drew two lines in between this piece and this piece to make a higher highlight, a denser highlight than I have further down where I've only stitched one line in between the existing lines. And you're going to ask me, okay, how do you know how tight that I want that to be? Well, remember that we're measuring density just like any other time, right? When we're dealing with density, we know that if we can measure across three lines, and I can do that here, measuring from one across the second to the third, we look at the bottom uh, left-hand corner of the screen here, right under my head, you can see that it says that the length is 0.8 millimeters, which means I've got an eight point or a 0.8 density that I'm hitting with this overall piece. What does that mean? I've got half coverage with 40 weight thread. So I've got half coverage with 40 weight thread here, and that means that I've got that half density. If I know what half coverage is going to look like, I've got a good idea of what's happening in here, and I can draw that way. And in fact, the other thing to remember is when I started the initial piece, um, the initial density is set to, to a degree where, though I have this accordion that does vary it across the piece, it has some uh, variation in density from the top to the bottom, Roughly, I have about a quarter density in this overall piece. It's, it's getting close to that kind of 1.2 uh, area in some of this. And I can look at that density. I can look at any given area and find about how much density I have in that space by looking at what's there. But as we can see from zooming out on it, look how, how kind of naturalistic that looks and how we have these areas of, of density and areas of looseness and openness. And then if we go back to the original piece, you can see, and not as much here, better in the mountains, uh, though there is more contrast here, we can see how that does kind of uh, blend together and we get some areas that are just more uh, highly figured than others, more dense than others, just because of the closeness of the piece. And we're working into the existing stitches. Now I will show you really quickly a couple of the other pieces like this. Um, first thing is, there's our, these are our little grass fields. And when we look at the original, we can see it has this kind of sense of having these layers of grasses coming toward us. And we can see here that they look like they're blending in pretty well. They're not just all stark lines on top of each other, partially because the lighter color on the front has shadows where the stitch penetration points are that bring it down into the piece that make it look a little darker. But if we look at the way it's built, you might think I'm doing a bunch of that manual stitching in between these pieces. Uh, but when we're talking about building the grass, you can see that these two layers, these are from the original piece are just, uh, fill stitches that are rough, but we can actually look here and these are uh, a redigitized piece. It was done natively here in Stitch Artist. So you can take a look at it. And these are actually three fills. So when I show these to you, I can go ahead and I can break these apart if you want to see them real quickly. These are the three fills that we're working with. This is actually the base layer in a, in a kind of a dirty green color. And then we have a goldish color and a reddish kind of umber color that's coming up to the front. And I'm going to show you this different these different pieces together and we can see how they're built, right? So we have these three layers and originally it looked like I was doing a bunch of manual work. Absolutely not. If I show you the actual design objects, what you're going to find out is that all these three layers are the same object. 
you look at this piece and it is only the fill. There is the, the line that's underneath it. It is a very simple line. And you would say, all right, what about the other ones? Well, let me grab out one of the other ones. And you can already see it when I have it selected. It's that same shape. It's the absolutely the same shape three times over. But these are three times laid on top of each other. Well, what you might assume then is that if I want to target density that's full coverage, uh, what are the kind of densities I'm working with? Well, down here in this piece, the first piece is accounts for about half the density. So it's at a half density for a 40 weight thread. That's eight points. So uh, that would be 0.8 millimeters or eight embroidery points. And the other things to know about this piece, in order to get some interesting texture, I've got my randomness up at 25%. Uh, percent. It could be different. The way it's laid out is going to be different in different software, but you will have some sort of stitch length randomness to look at and work with. But we got nice four millimeter stitches. We've got a uh, randomness of 25% in this case, standard tatami pattern. And we do have an underlay just on the very base layer. Uh, this is assuming that I've got some contrast between the, the garment or the color I'm working on top of in this piece. But what we see is half density. So what does that mean for our other two layers? Well, we can assume if we want that to be most of the density in the background, but we're just going to have a little bit of color that's on top. Each one of these other layers are now at a quarter density. So in this case, that is 12 points for embroidery points or 1.2 mils. That's the way that works. So we have 1.2 mils or 12 embroidery points for each one of these. And then to get the variation in the edges and to have the differences in the height that we're seeing at the top of this piece, it's all about setting either edge jaggedness or randomness. So in this case, we're seeing this piece. If I go ahead and check uh, edge jaggedness on this or feathering in this case, if you're in this software, you can see that on my right edge of the piece, I've got 25% uh, feathering and I've got 25% extension. So 25% of the roughness, 25% of the extension. Whereas if we go to the piece that's in front, I have zero extension. So what does that mean? If we look at the shape that's on the gold, this top of the shape is right here. We're extending out past the shape. In this case, we have no extension. So that roughness is cutting into the shape. And that's why we can see that we've got a reveal where the gold is sticking out taller. Does that mean there's some lesser densities in some of these areas? Absolutely it does. But as you can see in the final piece, that's not showing through any of the garment in a way that's bad. And when we think about what ended up happening with this piece where we went with this natural color uh, for the patch, with a natural color behind it and a fair amount of density, we're not seeing too much trouble. We have some underlay there. Uh, we have enough underlay, enough coverage from all the different colors that honestly, we're not seeing any sort of thin spots or any area that's sticking out when we have some lesser areas of that front coverage. Now you can work it in such a way that you don't have that where you make sure that everything extends out. We just have further extension on the back one than we have on the front. And in fact, if we go back in here, we can always play with that stuff. Uh, if we look at this piece here, we can go ahead and grab our fills. We have that gold fill. I could go back into my feathering and crank up my extension quite a bit. We could actually give it massive amounts of extension. You could do that. And you could use it to go above the shape. In the case of this particular shape, I wasn't too worried about it dipping a little bit underneath or having a little bit of that other color showing through, especially because I had some other stitching that was done right under the edge here. We had some other stitching that was defining uh, what we'll call the shore of the river that's back there, the kind of the sandy area of the river. So I wasn't too worried about that being there. Um, but we did kind of have that bank of the river that was back behind it and it was covering some of that up. But if you were concerned about that, instead of having zero extension on that front, we could go ahead and say, get back into our feathering and we've got that zero extension. Let's go ahead and turn that extension up to, you know, 25%. Let's get it, that out there a little bit, 20%, something like that. So we're starting to cover everything, maybe a little bit more. So 35%. Now we're covering the entire area of the piece. We have a little extension. We'll grab our other piece here. We'll get to our feathering. We'll get that extension even further out to like 40% maybe even higher, so we really go past it. And we can play with that extension, and you find out that you get some very naturalistic, decent-looking things like grass without too much worry. And the other thing you might worry about is when these things are lining up perfectly, as you can see here after they're generated, when we have nice big edges, areas to tuck in like we do on the edge of this patch especially, and when we're dealing with a half-density measurement of movement back and forth, we can actually grab this piece once the stitches are generated. Your software is going to depend how this works. Uh, here we can grab the piece after the software is generated, generated the stitches, as long as we don't change anything for it to make it regenerate. And we can tap it over until we have an alignment that allows those to kind of feather in together. And it's only the, a matter of like a couple of tenths of a millimeter to get to do it. Is it going to be perfect alignment? No. In the case of this piece where we have enough coverage, 
uh, overall, we can end up getting a nice blend and we can also decide on which ones on the top to get a better look. So like I said, this is just another way we can use to, to make marks that makes this a little more impressive, that you can make something that looks fairly, fairly naturalistic without working too hard at it. Same thing with this piece. Um, two fills with some text on top or with some uh, manual on top of it. I like to use manual stitches to break things up. And I kind of always talk about that where I'm breaking up the outlines and the pattern and the texture of a fill by adding manual stitches. And if we look at this piece here, we have this reed constructed as well. I wanted to show you that same kind of look. We've done some reproduction on this thing to make it uh, make sense for that. And we'll go ahead and grab this and put it in the right spot for you. But in this design, we can see that we've got some fill stitch blocks and we have our run stitch blocks as well, kind of making the rest of these uh, branches. And then we have our final, essentially manual, but I've used a run stitch to do manual work. Uh, if you drop hard points, every time you drop a hard or line point, it's going to cause a needle down. It's going to make it drop. So you can actually kind of use a, especially in small areas, you can use your straight stitch or run stitch tool on a line. And if you're dropping hard points, uh, it will always drop that needle and it can essentially work kind of like a maximum stitch length. You can set the length of that line and get like kind of a maximum stitch length to make that work. Well, let's look at this piece kind of broken apart again. So if we go back here to the fills, I'll go ahead and drag these apart. Here's our, here's our little tree and you can see it's made of runs and columns. Here are our two fills. Here's our manual stitch. So we've got all of our pieces just like I showed you previously, slightly different because the softwares differ, but very similar. And we'll go ahead and take a look at how these pieces are put together, right? So essentially the fills are pretty simple. We have fill shapes that are not non-standard. We've got the, the normal shape that we were looking at before. Uh, the thing to look at on these is once again, that I have done that slight offset and tapped them in so that they overlap, so that they are uh, kind of uh, one ha half density off from each other. What I will say is that I'm getting pretty full coverage in here. When we look at the actual settings on this piece, uh, these are about these are a about a full density between the two of them. So what we're gonna see is uh, the density here is at eight points or 0.8 mils. So put them both together and you get about 0.4. I could go a little lighter than that for sure. Um, if I'm concerned about contrast, I might go ahead and stick with that 0.4 or four embroidery points. You really could go a little bit lighter, especially on something that's natural like that. But I'm gonna say that this much manual stitching on top of it and the small amount of overlap that I have, uh, either with these run stitches or where these column stitches that make up the trunk of the tree are on top of, I'm not concerned at all with it having that be a full, uh, full density overall. So I'm not having too much trouble with that, but we can see that I have this fairly normal stitch type. We've got a single curve on it. Interesting things to notice. We have 25% randomness. We've got a four millimeter stitch length on top of that. No big deal. So nothing else special has been done to this fill aside from it being half density. The second thing is a second fill is on top of it. And as you saw, I tapped them apart so that they are every other. I did that same kind of positioning I showed you before where we're off by that one density or uh, one density measurement. We just tap it in with our, our arrow keys until we get that well, control plus the arrow key gives us a one, a 0.1 millimeter tap. We can nudge that into place after we've generated the stitches. And then we can see these run stitches that are done in multiple blocks being used to create the tree. So we have runs and then columns, runs and columns back and forth, aside from this one big run stitch area. And we've plotted it so that we get a nice little overlap in the tree here. And I actually need to adjust this. These, these uh, columns don't need to have that. <laughs> they don't need to have that underlay on them that they do. That's me doing this quickly before the show. Uh, but we can go ahead and drop that out. They do not need all that underlay. But these columns are made to overlap and to make nice little shapes so it looks like a little bunched trunk in the center. And we have little overlaps on them. But once again, I'm not too concerned about satins overlapping edge to edge like that in this small area. No big deal. But let's go ahead and take a look at how that runs. We'll zoom out until we get back to our rebuilt piece. Very similar to the other piece though, right? We've got a little bit of underlay on the base layer. You might need that. You might not, depending on the color that you're going on. We have that half density fill going out to the top. In this case, I ran the other one in the same direction. You could probably run it back the other direction. Wouldn't cause any trouble. Runs on the top from there. And then we get the stems going on here. So the branches are done in that straight stitch. About 2.5 millimeters, I believe, on that. Um, you can go longer if you want to. You can go shorter if you want to. I usually on outlining, I'll be anywhere from two to three mils if I want it to be nice and crisp and be able to hold a curve. And we create all those pieces just by drawing out in tours. And in fact, I'll go ahead and pop these stitch by stitch for a second so you can see them out to the edge and then back. If you ever talk, hear me talk about going out in tours, this is what that looks like. Every line's getting two stitches exactly. And we're following them in tours out and back, out and back. 
and then out to our satins to create our final piece. And you'll see that there's some kind of interlacing of these pieces to make them sit at different heights and back to our eventual piece here. And that's our final satin for the trunk. And so all of this is pretty simple. I have done very little manual work aside from having to do the outlining in the branches, which is something you're just going to have to do. That's not something you can usually avoid. But then we get into this piece. And here's where you can see I'm working in to my stitches. You'll see some of these are across the stitch, stitches on purpose. Others are following the curvature. Here we follow the curvature for a little bit, make it light, make it sink in. And then we have a few that go across it at different angles. Why? Because I want them to really highlight the edge of the tree. I want those to pop out. Same thing here. Every once in a while we're filling, then I have our, our little tree, the little leaves that stick out at the top. Following those edges again, we're doing that kind of wormy stitch, but then here we go again. I'm following the, the piece up here so that feathers back a little bit and sinks in. Follow it a little bit, then do some that are cross entirely. A little more of that wormy stitch to break up the outlines, follow it toward that bottom edge so it feathers in. Then we do a little bit of zigzagging so it really stands up on top. And we finish it, right? And as we can see, we have that, it looks very random. It looks like it's just hash. But when we look at the final piece, that hash makes the light reflect differently off of the different angles of the stitches. And it works both in, sinking in. You can see those areas there it blended in where they were following the same line here and here. Those were following that curve a little bit in here, but that little zigzag down at the bottom and the ones that were up in the top over here where we went contrary to the, to the uh, angle of the fill and the ones that were here on the edge, they shine, they stick out, they sit on top. We're working on top, we're working in. So like I said, that is really the crux of this thing is just what is underneath the place where we're working. And I think that's it. I'm not saying we don't think about that. I think that sometimes we maybe don't think about it enough or we don't really consider it that much, whereas it is something that we can do. And the technique that's important about this is to create that base fill, even if you're going to work under it. Like I showed you earlier with those clouds, you can create what is the base fill or the main color area, even if you want to shade underneath it ahead of time. And then you work onto that piece. And in fact, the other thing you can do you can also create a sacrificial version of that piece that you're going to eventually copy out and play, paste in. Or if you're worried about hitting a target density, create the shape that you're looking at. In fact, we can, we can kind of show something like that. I believe I have something in here. And if not, I can just explain it either way. We can create like a sacrificial fill that acts like uh, that acts like the piece that we're eventually going to use. So let's say we're up in here and we're trying to do this piece that we were working on all these the areas and we're not sure about what the target density was going to be for this piece. We could always take that initial fill. We can copy that initial fill that we're going to use. We can paste it back in here and I can go to my, my fill settings on this fill. I can create it at full density. I can go, all right, this thing is really supposed to be, you know, I'm, I'm trying to hit a target of four point density or that's what I'm used to doing. We turn off all of our accordion stuff. We don't have any of that there. So now I've got a full density fill. We grab this thing, we change it to a color that we're not using in the rest of that body of the piece, and then we stick it underneath everything. We put it underneath the rest of what we're working on. And then what we can do is say, all right, as I'm starting to work on this piece, if I'm worried about my density, I can look at that red fill density, and I'll have to also hide out uh, this other fill that I'm working with and say, all right, I'm looking at it and I can see red through it. The red is my full density fill. That's the full density I could reach if I was at four points. And I can say, all right, if I'm looking at my pieces, I'm not at that density, I'm about at half density. And I'm working on top of that fill and it helps as a guideline. You can use it to say, oh, that's what a full density fill will look like. And then when you're done doing all your work and you don't want this fill anymore, you can delete that out of there and say, all right, I can see about how full density is versus what I'm working on. So you can use that as a guideline. On curved fills, it's a lot harder to make sense of that. I do that mostly when I'm doing manual work for shading. I will use a sacrificial fill like that as a guideline. Um, but that's something that you can do. Remember that no matter how you get to your end result, it's fine. You can throw this stuff away. You can draw lines that you're never going to use. You can use a sacrificial fill to show you how far apart lines are going to be in a full density fill so that you're not always going back and measuring. Now, the other thing to remember is if we're digitizing, we should have our we should have our grid on. And if we're looking at this grid, it's a little harder to see on screen. But if I'm zoomed in nice and tight, uh, these grid lines are at one millimeter. The sub lines are at one millimeter. The dark lines are at 10. 
in this particular software. You can set yours or whatever they're going to be like. But if I know that I've got one millimeter here and I know that 0.4 density on three rows is going to be uh, you know, full target density, then I know once I'm getting to be about seven or so rows of stitching in this area, this block, then I'm getting up to full stitching and I don't have to worry as much. You will just get a feeling for full density as you get onto these pieces. In the case of working on top of a full density piece that's already there, like this background, um, the only reason it doesn't work just to work on top of the background piece here is that we're using a curved shading fill on top of a single curve. Like I have a multi-curve fill here, which actually I'll, I'll pull this out so you can see it. The curvature of the fill has multiple curve points. If you didn't know this about curved fills in your software, almost all of them will allow you to add more points to the curve and adjust it so you get a multi-curve fill. Um, I don't think everybody's always aware of that because they come in populated with one curve and people will uh, assume that that one curvature, like if I go in here, this is what usually comes in. You get one curve point and you're thinking, okay, that's what I can have. Well, on that line, if you select it, you can go back in and uh, you can drop in another point and then get yourself a multi-curve fill. The thing to remember is if you do any really aggressive curvature in that fill, um, in the hollow of that aggressive curvature, you will have light density areas. As you can see here, the spacing will get a little wonky inside of there because we're ultimately dealing with straight lines that are trying to approximate a curve. So you might get some looseness in there that you don't really intend to. But the reason why I can't just use this background to kind of give me a fill guide and I had to make my own guide there is because we have a different curvature from that top uh, shading stitching as we do from the actual fill. Otherwise, I would just work on top of this fill and it would be no big deal to see what I was doing. But yeah, it's just something to look at, that working in. And you guys have seen me talk about it with our friend, the jumping mouse here. Um, let's go and find him in the actual images so we can see him as he is. Here's our jumping mouse friend again. I'm not gonna belabor this one, just to, but just to show it to you again so we can remember the fact that working in is also, working in and working on is also how we deal with textures. Um, if we're looking at this piece, we have our initial backgrounds. We have a little bit of fill that's going to show through on purpose because I have some density lightened up in there. We have our body, which is made of initially three curved fill sections. They are opposing fills so that we get some nice texture. We are then working with some shading that's on top. We do have some manual shading being done in the head at this point. So there are some manual lines that break things up, break up the stitch angles. And we have this guy that makes the uh, shoulder look kind of nice and lively being a different shape, but then we're shading on top. And as you see, we are working into the angles of the fill for most of it. It's a little bit off of that angle, but mostly we're working into those same angles, at least into the middle section. We work the same curvature in the back. We work against the curvature in the front of the head because we want these lines to stand up and be distinct. It's all about what we're trying to achieve. We want more blending in the back. We want more uh, detail in the head. So here we work in, here we work on. And even then you'll see in the top of the head, what do we do? Start finding that uh, fill line again. And we only really work on in the places where we want the face to look fuzzy and to look rough around the cheeks, around the back of the eye, where we're breaking up the outline of the shapes of those stitch blocks. So we work on and in, and then at the very last on the third color, we use that manual stitching that goes all different directions. And what I'm gonna call this honestly, it's a screen, right? So what I'm gonna say, is I call that kind of like screening. Why do I call it screening? What do I think about that? Because we're doing a textural alteration. We are in our layering, we are altering the texture because once I, I have this piece here where I've got these little lines, do you see how it breaks up the pattern of the fill? In the back, I don't have them. So that keeps that very distinct pattern and grain to the fill. But in the back, we have these randomized lines or in the in the sway of the mid back for this little mouse, we have all these randomized lines and it breaks up the, the angle. The thing is that's once again, working in versus working on. The rest of these fills are worked into the curvature, but the manual stitching on top is worked on top of it against that curvature to break it up, to screen it. And then the other thing you can see is I've broken up the edge by manually going out past the edge with my shading runs so that I get a little bit of roughness here and it blends. The other thing to look at, there's another bit of working under that I talked earlier. When I did my initial fills, you'll see I wanted to break up this open edge of the fill. I call it the open edge where it's the edge of the, um, the edge of the fill that doesn't have penetration points on it. The thing to realize is on any fill like that, you can't make that rough because it's just the edge of the stitches. So if I want the same roughness in the back that I can get from using edge feathering or that I can get from jagged edges or feathering, I have to create it myself. So before I ran that, I stopped and used manual stitching 
to create this little raft of, of rough edges that's going to be underneath the top fill so that I get roughness all around the edge, all around the side. So we have to remember that's our working under. So working under, working on, working in. All it's about is how the different stitch angles jive together. So that's our little mouse friend, right? But then, I mean, it's the same thing with blending, though I'm gonna go ahead and give you one more. I've got a, one more little guy who I thought was fun. You guys always see the little cute mouse, but if I can find it, I've got one, another one that I brought in here and I might not be able to bring it up. I had one that I opened earlier and I think I might lost it. No, there it is. This is one that has a lot simpler version, an earlier little mouse guy that I did. And I know it's weird that I've got mice and rats, but I just thought it was funny that I had another one that showed you a simpler version of this blending. The thing to realize about this guy, much more cartoony, not really realistic, but he does have some of that blending and layering going on. First thing to see, uh, the inside of his ears are done in curved fills, and we do his teeth as individual satin stitches because he's got some nice, rough, uh, raggedy teeth that are going to come into play later. And then what are we doing again? We've got a satin stitch here. We're working into the satin stitch with a zigzag. We've got a fill stitch here. We're working into that fill stitch with an, a curved fill that matches it. So we haven't done any manual work here. Zigzag. Now we did a little bit of manual work in the teeth and we can do, do the manual work to create that zigzag. You could also use a zigzag stitch if you set your angles correctly. But also he's got some cruft. His teeth look a little rough. Well, we're going to go ahead and add those with a manual zigzag as well. There's his nose, his little fingers are done with satin stitches. We got a nice satin for his tail, his hands. Then we do some nice uh, auto splits and some satins for his limbs. And then we go with this nice big curved fill. And once again, curved fill, randomization in the stitch length to get some nice texture. And so we get some texture there. We get some nice satins for the, uh, for the ear edges, the top of his little hair. And then we use a nice curved fill for the face. And in this case, I decided to leave the face smoother and the body rougher to give a little bit more textural difference there. And then we work in, once again, into the angle of the face. We're doing our, our stitching here, but then we change our angle to do some more aggressive shading under the arm. We work into the leg. We use that same kind of technique to go under the belly and get some roughness under the belly. We work into the angle of the leg as well back here. And we do the same up the back edge of the body, under the arm, back of the head. And then we do the same around the lip, but we start to work against the angle a little bit to create some roughness. And then we work completely against the angles to make uh, some border lines that are underneath this piece. Then we use a nice, just open fill. Once again, open curved fill with some points and some jaggedness that's made to do the rest of the shading of the body. So we only do a little bit of manual work, not much, doesn't take long. And then we jump in and use a fill stitch. We use a, a, just a nice curvature of fill that matches the body. We're working in some randomness to the length to get the rest of that body curvature set. Then we've got his wrench. And of course, this guy's very cartoony. So he's got some nice cartoony outlines that make the day for him. So here's our little uh, rat that was done for the TS Global Lab for, uh, I believe this is for Intel, uh, where it was Rio Rancho and Bangalore, India. Yeah, Rio Rancho is where Intel is located. So very likely this lab rat, <laughs> as you can see, was done for the Intel folks out here in New Mexico. But one, once again, these examples just show you it doesn't have to be really detailed or a ton of manual work in order to work into the stitches and make something interesting. So once again, same kind of setup, we're looking at this over and over, but it's the same stuff to learn from. Uh, same thing here, we've got some interesting stuff with our blue scale quail here, and this is once again, some shading. Let's see if we can look at the original. I didn't have the best image for my friend, the quail. I need to run him again. Here's the original quail head I was working from, and we've got that in the image as well. This is the final image I have. The, the contrast is not great, but you can see there's blending in the face, there's blending in the neck, we've got some nice little shading around the feathers, these scale feathers that are in the neck. And so it's got some interesting texture that's going on that's worth checking out. Uh, so let's go ahead and just run this one back and we can kind of talk about it too. Got our Zia, but here's our first piece. What do we have again? Our friend, the curved fill with randomized stitches. Yes, I know. I'm lazy. I don't want to digitize everything individually unless I have to, and it makes a difference. In the case of this little quail, I was trying to get the scales to look good as individual feathers. And frankly, it looked better when I didn't. And the roughness made a little more sense. And honestly, because it had figured little stitches, it has this very distinct outline pattern 
that I was kind of losing when I was using too much texture. It looked better as a fill than it did when I tried to do individual feathers. Not usually my go. I will usually put the feathers in there, but when it doesn't look good, I will get lazy real quick because honestly, I will all day, every day work extra hard to make it look great. If it's not going to look any better for the extra hard work, believe me, I'm going to try something that makes it a little faster for me. So we did that first. That's that's the way we started building that thing up. But then you'll start to see we've got a different curve fill, a lighter fill. And there's a reason why that's lighter. Why is that light density? Because we're going to go ahead and put more stitching into it later. And that's a different fill with roughness for the for the cheek, for the face. And then these are actually contours. Those are columns with contour stitching. And actually, I'll zoom in and show them to you. Each one of these little feathers gets an extra little uh, pop of interest to the texture because these are actually vertical contour stitches. So if you've ever seen this as a satin stitch type, there's individual columns of stitches that are set vertically at full, full density, but they are contours. So they follow the contours of the shape. They go up and down each one of the columns instead of being horizontal. We can see that even in later into the bird, once we get up into um, these crown feathers are also contour columns instead of satin columns. And then we also did the same for the uh, crown crest in the front. But what you can see is um, because I had a lot of contrast and I didn't like how much show through I was getting, I created myself a manual fill underlay under that contour stitch before it stitched so that when this loose contour appeared, um, I layered it in two layers. You can see there's one layer and then a second layer of that contour to make a nice fill. But those two contour columns are on top of a nice little manual underlay that I put together to help it out. But let's go ahead and go back to the rest of the piece and kind of look at it as a as a whole one more time. We can see there's our curved fill, our lighter curved fill here. We have our contour pieces. That neck is a pretty full density in the neck there, but then we have shading. How does that shading worked? into the angles of the piece. So we're working into those angles again, and then we counter them into the back here. We work into the angles on the neck so it's softer, and then we use it to define the edges of the head as we go into the back, we work against it. So into and opposite. Also, we're following natural patterns that are in the art. So there's a little side of the head, and then these this shading here, this all of this is done manually, but what we can see if we zoom in, this is very distinctly and on purpose worked in the angles of the fill. So this is supposed to be nice and subtle. We want to have subtle feathering. We want to have these edges defined with that darker blue. But as we do it, we are working into the angle of the fill. We're working in. And then we keep on through the piece working in as we do these other stripes along the neck and along the back of the neck in that same blue. We work up to the top of the head and it has a fully filled area of the blue. And then we have our contours. We then have a highlight blue that goes around the eye and we have that lighter color and it also fills in once again, working into the existing fill here. So we have that highlight blue that works around the face and works into the existing angles of the shading and of the underlying fill so that we build up to a target density and still to keep that texture. But we work on top of these other angles up here so that we have this feather pattern that stands out. So we're blending down here. We are standing out up at the top where we want that fringe. Then we do our outlining work and a little bit of shading, once again, working into the direction of the fill. We have our nice uh, double satins for the beak. And then we do some outlining work to define the, uh, the last piece of it. And we have our lovely little star for our uh, specular highlight in the eye. So once again, same kind of stuff, same kind of work. I know over and over again, you'll see that same look, but when you want it to be subtle, we align it. Uh, when we want it to stand up, we offset it. That's how we're dealing with those angles. And honestly, it's it's a choice that you make as you're working. Uh, same thing here, NCRS Super Nationals. This is an earlier piece of mine. Though what we can see is we've got some just some very light shading here. Let's go ahead and show you the original piece again. I'll back out from our friend the quail. We'll take a look at the NCRS chapter meet. Has some simple work done in these mountains in the back. So we've got some of that going on here. We've got some simple satin stitch stuff because we want to have like these, these cliffs that are here have some pretty dense work, but the rest of this is light shading. We've got some light shading, some uh, regular accordion shading happening both at the bottom of the car, uh, of the body panels, and in this cutout that's here. And we've got just some standard, very light shading happening around the body. Though I'm going to say this, um, originally done on light colors, this piece. And when it was done on the original light colors, uh, this shadow around here was a shadow and not a bright color. So it was uh, actually switched on us later down the road, which is not great. Um, on a light garment, this little pool of 
shading down at the bottom would have been a shadow instead of being uh <laughs> instead of being something that looked a little different so we switched out the colors and i really should have fought for changing that color out as well and i did not do so but what we can see here is into that mountain i just want to show you that we've got this really simple flat fill so no curve fills no craziness but we have some dense zigzags being used to offset here so they're very very much standing up but as we get into this we just have light density fill that gets up to the top of the mountain matching this the same uh uh, the same textures and matching that same angle. And then we're working on top of that with our uh, straight stitches and with our lighter color. But we can see that in some of this shading, we match that fill layer. And so we get a little bit of softness in the deeper uh, satiny shading. Now, because it is a full satin on these pieces, it is going to still stand up, but we still get some interesting shading there. So we'll back that off. We can see that just that same kind of real simple version of that shading, just a light fill on top of it. Because those two fills are in the same angle, you don't see that really strong outline. What you just see is a slight shade. Because if we zoom in, even though it's not the best piece, and like I said, there's an early piece of mine that I don't think is my best piece, you can still see how those fall in a little bit. And I think I actually have, uh, I think I have an actual uh, tighter version of that from an, uh, an other sample that was done. And the thing to see is even with that really big difference in colors here, where the penetration points are in the stitches, it does fall together and blend. It doesn't stand up on top of itself quite so much. You can see that these look like they're roughly at the same height a little bit. It is only where they cross angles uh, that they look like they're very much different, that they're standing up on top of each other. So just another explanation for that, just showing that that piece, how it looks. And we can also see that we've got our full density fills for most of this, but we're using that nice light density gray accordion when you have a very light contrast difference and we're not building up a ton of density on this piece, you can see that we have some interesting kind of uh, shading that still works pretty well. Um, we'll back out and we'll see it at a better angle. I think that angle is not really giving us all the light, but we have just a nice light amount of shading here because we don't have a tremendous amount of contrast. Um, not trying to worry too much about doing multiple color blending to make that happen. Um, but we'll go ahead and back through this piece just real quickly. And you can just see how it's put together. Rest of the text is there. And then you can see that there's a, as we go to the outlining run, we have a nice little uh, accordion grade right at the bottom of the body. And the thing that you will see though, is that the accordion where it gets to full density, it falls off of that red fill. So the red fill stops a little early so that when this accordion gets to full density, we're not trying to stack two full density fills on top of each other. So just stuff to look at. Another interesting one. This is where we start getting into gradients. Uh, this is the Super Stripey RS4 piece, and I'll go ahead and pull this up. I've shown you other gradients before, so I'll show you this one. This is one that you don't always see me talk about. Um, but this one, this is all done with just layers of fill. So these are layers of fill with no manual stitching done whatsoever to get this gradient in the kind of teals that are in the planet or in this shadow and behind it. But you see how this looks kind of dotted? and it looks a little broken in the shadow, that's from those angles lining up. You can see that if we look at the digital, it looks like we're going to have these really stark lines here. But the thing that we can notice that's interesting is we're getting different values from a diff couple different reasons. Number one, we have spacing getting tighter and tighter as we layer. But the other thing to look at is we also are bringing in, we're allowing jaggedness just like that grass so that some areas have extra portions that are sticking out even further. So we have both a radial gradient, the lightest amount of this teal color is out at the outer edge where the shapes don't overlap. Then where these shapes overlap, we get this secondary gradient or this secondary amount of uh, texture and amount of coverage where they overlap. So we kind of have both the difference between uh, the layering going on and we have the difference between these shapes extending out beyond it and not having as much that fill. So we can kind of get a radial gradient. And I'll show you that again in those uh, little honeycombs on that Rhodesian Ridgeback patch I showed you. The other thing to look at is the ratios of fill here. These are done with layers of light density fill and I'll go ahead and spin you through it. So we've got our backgrounds here. You can see the, this is how we get the radial gradient for that glow around the planet. We have these multiple blocks and then we have the highlight here and you can see that I've left room for that highlight to get to my coverage. We also have a small shadow that goes around the outside edge. Then in the planet, what you're going to see is this. There's a full uh, over underlay. Here's a full density of the first color. And then we start to back it off to half and then a quarter. 
So we're just using straight densities. We're not worrying about overlapping them in multiple layers. In this case, we're just using light densities and overlapping them as much as we can. They will not align perfectly, but they look pretty decent in the final piece. And we do that again here where we have blocks of that individual density and we leave room for the top densities. Here we have a quarter of the next and then 50-50 and then full coverage on that next color. And we can see then the next stitch block starts to lighten up and then lighten even further. So we end up with a quarter density here at the end. And then the third color comes in starting at a quarter density, going 50-50, and then going full coverage in the area where we left room for that full coverage. So that's another simple way to do it. You end up with textures that aren't always excellent when you do it like that, where we just use a uh, single blocks with the density settings. And I'll say they're not, it's not bad necessarily, but when we look in here, we can definitely see that there are stark breaks at some points where you can see that gradient start to be just a little bit obvious right at the end here. And we can see that the textures vary a little bit in the piece. Uh, unlike something like my, um, like the Chavez firewood piece that I often show you guys. Uh, if you've ever seen my perfect blends article, this is a manual blend that's done here for that K. Or like I said, the, the Chavez firewood piece is the other piece that I often show that's a light, uh, light fit fill stitch piece, but it's done by doing multiple quarter density layers instead of just setting densities. And if we look at that piece where it's overlapped, um, it's much smoother in the overall outlook, but the way that we get that smoother texture is through a lot of wizardry of laying together, um, as you can see here, four shapes of each color at quarter density to get there instead of one shape just set to those 50% densities like you saw in that other piece. Um, but all of these work in a very similar way. How does this work? How do we get those blends? How do we get that to look that smooth? Well, it's really all about kind of working in. And I'll show you this piece. Um, this is one where we have a small patch that has these individual um, gradients that actually are curved. So we have radial gradients that go from this yellow in this curvature down into this kind of uh, darker color. Some of them have some other textures and some other colors in there, but they go down to kind of this warm uh, red orange color down at the bottom. And if we go ahead and pull that piece up and I'm going to go ahead and try and get that for you. Let's grab, we'll grab that piece as well. You can see that this is done with that same layering style. Like I showed you on the super stripey, we're working in again, you know, we're working into those different layers and we're trying to show that same kind of work where we're trying to leave areas for the final pieces to go together and layering it throughout the piece. So let's see if we can grab that too. So the Rhodesian Ridgeback club patch, um, is an interesting piece to kind of show that as well. We'll grab that and give you a look at the final piece. So this is the way it was digitized to look at it once again. And I know I will stop here shortly because I think we're getting so, so far into this that we might be going to another setup for sure. But let's, let's kind of show it here really quickly as it's put together. Each one of those little cells actually has multiple fills in multiple colors put into it. And I'm going to go ahead and run it back till we get to one of the cells so you can see it. So the first thing is we actually have a gradient in the upper left-hand corner in the gold. And this is where we're laying in multiple layers of that quarter density. And in this case, you can see four layers of that gold. There's one quarter, one half, and they get smaller and smaller until there's full density out into this corner. So by the time we get to this point, we have full density. That is four layers that creates that full density. Then we get into the orange. And once I get into it, you can see this on the other piece that's here. They, get, they start out at that small point and we can see that we have successive areas where we're actually leaving some space and it continues to radiate. And how do we do that is by actually cutting that shape each time. And you can see that those four layers come together to match with the layers on the piece. Where it falls apart a little bit is where we can't avoid those transits between the rows. The transits between the rows are gonna stand on top a little bit and they're going to be visible. And so you can see that happening through those pieces, through all of those orange layers. And then the darkest layer only comes in and does one shade. It is only adding a quarter of that darkest color into that piece. It's not doing the full coloration because we don't really need to go to full color on that piece. So what you can see is once again, and even in this little bit of shading that's done here, we're working in, we're matching angles and we're leaving space. So that's the thing to, to remember. We're leaving space, we're building in layers. And when we're doing a radial gradient, it's all about cutting back those edges. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and show you the original piece again and say, it's not 
when you select the right colors, it's not jarring that we have those transitions. It still looks pretty good. I mean, if I zoom in on this piece, this is a pretty tight zoom on this patch. So I'm being fairly unforgiving with myself. You can absolutely see any, any errors that are in this piece. And there are some pieces, some bits that aren't exactly perfect. There's some coverage issues in the bees wing, what have you. Uh, at this size, when we're zooming in this tight, it's not something that I would be too critical about. But you can see zoomed in that 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 transition looks fairly natural, but where there is some texture, that's those transits. Those are the transits in the fill. But when you zoom out from this piece and look at it at any distance, because this is a normal left chest patch, it's not a huge piece. Um, if I zoom out and show you the entirety of the piece as it is, we can actually go ahead and check it out. It's a large piece, but it's not outwardly massive. With a full patch, patch edge on it, this piece comes in under four inches wide. So not tremendously huge, but a large piece. But when we look at that piece at scale, we can see that that absolutely works out and gives us a pretty decent coloration and a decent gradation without worrying too much. So like I said, it's we're not going to go through all the different pieces. What I can tell you is it's all about worrying about those layers and understanding working in and working on. I think the last one I'll go to, um, we'll take a quick look at this piece here. This is the Dirty Dukes piece. And I have a little bit too much contrast between this gray and white. And I actually pumped up that contrast. You can see on the piece that we ended up running, it's the contrast is not that high, but I pumped it up on the image so you can really see where those lines are and how they fall together. But I want you to actually see the design itself. And we can take a, a quick look at that. And uh, we can grab that Dukes piece. I think it'll be worthwhile to kind of take a look at it and see how it's put together. And you can see the difference. Um, now, this is certainly, I've got a couple of pieces here. I was explaining uh, patch styles in, in the um, edge or automatic merrily setup that we have. So ignore the patches. These are just me explaining patch style to somebody. But I thought it was worthwhile to take a look at this guy and see how he runs, right? So this is our Dirty Duke. Again, we can see how these pieces are put together. And we can see the multiple kinds of shading there in the, in the crown here, in the helmet. I think I'll go back to the original again so you can kind of see that helmet. Let's pull that up and just give you a, a quick look at it again how we have those multiple layers of shading where some areas are darker, some areas are lighter, even though we're only using one color to shade, that's all about the layering. That's all about uh, how many times we interact with it and how you see some of them sink in. That's because we're, we're doing a good job of matching our angles, right? We're matching our angles, but you can also see that when we have a light uh, zigzag on a satin stitch, you can't avoid some amount of showing because we have the angles that don't line up. I could always have made a solid outline on the bottom edge and this jumped in and out, but it still would have been pretty dense. It still would have been pretty visible. So like I said, we can see that piece. I would like to run it back for you so you can just kind of see how it's built one more time. So let's ignore our patch friends over here. I still had those on the sheet, but we can see some interesting things. I've built these shadows behind the eyes ahead of time because we have those nice big black shadows inside the eyes. Individual teeth with satin stitches, satins on the uh, jaw, on the upper teeth. And then we have separations into the body of the uh, orbits, the cheekbones, and the uh, mid phase and the cheekbones underneath the top of the vault of the head. We once again have our nice curvature of the fill for the vault for the forehead boss. And then we have these nice satins to make those carved brow ridges. But we see we've got some different work happening, right? Back in the side, behind the jawbone, we're working into the fill, we're matching those angles, we're doing the same as we go onto the jawbone itself, though the zigzags are gonna show. We outline our teeth with that same color, come back around, we're doing zigzags to match into, working into the fills, into the satins around the eye. We do the same thing up around the brow ridge, but then we work into that curved fill and we work into that curved fill in more than one layer. If we back through this thing, we can see, back it up a little bit, we can see that uh, we're working multiple layers of fill into that piece. We've got our zigzags that are working through this piece. We're working that zigzag in multiple layers as well to create extra darkness and texture in that area. But once we get up past some of that area into that fill, we can see that we're working around those edges into those same fill angles. And as we get into the fill itself, we're matching into the curvature. And watch how I'm building a fill style shade, working into the curvature, continuing throughout the piece, and then overlapping for multiple layers in the back edges here so that we work into it two layers in and get a denser uh, coverage in that edge. More lines. Darker coverage, of course, we know that's how it works. So we go through that piece doing all the rest of the shading very similarly. Then I want to show you, we get into the uh, Conquistador helmet here and we've got nice curved fills. We have a uh, nice auto split satin or length limit satin being used to get that ridge for that Morian helmet kind of crest. Then we work into the fills and you can see 
where we want light shading, we only have one layer where we want darker shading. We put two layers together. We work into them, both matching the fill curvature from the rest of the helmet and working into the existing fill that was already there, working between the lines of that fill. So as we go through between the lines of the fill to make more density in between. So we have a darker area here and then a lighter area around the edge. And we do that throughout the rest of the helmet, working those two sides of it, working the darker, working the lighter into the edge of the fill. And as we see, we have those two, we go manually back and forth between these sides, leaving that seam so we get a nice crest in the center and then working back up, only darkening this edge further and going back to the original portion. We go ahead and go through those zigzags around the inside edge here. As you can see, they are visible. We have a fair amount of contrast. If I was doing this again, I think I would lighten up the color we used for the shading on the helmet. And then we have our plumes and our final uh, outlining work is done with that. So like I said, uh, you can see it when I pump up the contrast, you'll see it even more. I think, like I said, I would lighten up the color that we used for this. It was supposed to look a little grimy, a little rough because we have this, you know, zombified duke head. We have a skull. This is not supposed to look clean and shiny. But if I pump up that contrast, we can see even in the gray how it's put together. But in the actual piece where we have the unaltered, the unaltered photo, this is how it actually turned out. Uh, we get a nice amount of shading, but in the places where we worked with the angle of the fill, it really sunk in a little bit. In fact, I think you might want to use either shorter stitches in the underlying fill or longer stitches in the shading to get a little bit more out of it because it really does. When you match the angle of that fill, it can sink a little bit. So, all right, I'm not going to go through every single thing that we were going to touch on here today. We've got other things that we can discuss for later, but I think it's worthwhile just to kind of come back across this and say, here's the stuff that I think is the takeaway. Uh, on this when we're talking about working into existing stitches, right? Whether you're doing shading, whether you're doing detail work, I think it is very worthwhile to think about everything in layers. So understand your layering, look at the existing stitching that's underneath it and work with it on screen working in. And of course, like I said, you may want to do things like put sacrificial fills up. If you need to be able to do shading, you're trying to figure out where your lines are, where I showed you those multiple layers of, of shading coming together. It really is about making sure you're hitting those target densities. So realize that selective density also means that you can work to target densities or like I showed you before, and like I showed you in each of those pieces, we can have areas where we retract, we make shapes smaller, we retract edges using randomness or using feathering. And we have areas that have less density because they extend out beyond other shapes, or we can have them have less density because we literally lighten the densities inside of the settings. These are two ways that we get density by layering the density in and by adjusting our settings or by drawing our lines further apart. Uh, we can also remember that there's textural alteration. So not only are we looking at our existing fill stitches or our existing stitches in general so that we can work with them to blend, we can also work kind of against them to knock down textures, to break up fill lines and to make something interesting texturally with them by screening them. We can also do things like add edge, edge texture by working under a piece to give the open edges of satins or fills, the ends of satins, the open edges of fills that are the side of the stitch that don't have stitch penetration points, roughness by working things underneath them or by in our shading layer, working roughness into that shading layer on top. We're working on things like animals or organic pieces. So that's the thing. It is in, on, and under. What are we doing to work into the stitches that are there, into the angle that's there? How are we using the opposing of those angles to make things stand up? And how can we work under them either to create smoother looks by having our shading underneath and then having the largest part of the fill on top so that we get more continuity in the fill or uh, working underneath so we can do things like those edge textures. I think that's just kind of interesting. It's more about thinking about construction. So whether it's shading or detail, um, working in is just about looking at the construction, seeing what exists there and working with it and understanding the physicality of the thread. So layering, gradients, blending. And I know we can talk about gradients again. I think I'm going to have to go over the gradient portion of this a little bit more. I had even intended at one point to talk to you guys about um, ratios and the whole bit. It can't all be done in one sitting usually. I mean, it's a lot of stuff I wanted to cover. We will get back to ratios and blending and all of that at another time. We'll get back to gradients. 
But working in is the beginning of that. Understanding that you're layering things together, knowing the physicality of the thread makes sense. Let's grab the last few comments real quick, and then we'll go ahead and finish off for the day. Uh, Joe Rita says, my big problem is density. How far apart do I want my stitching lines to let so much show through? Trial and error, test stitch, and more tests. Sometimes it's like that because the other thing people forget is that color is not uniform. Sometimes different contrast levels look like more stitching is showing through or not. We will see more of our underlying stitching when the contrast is higher between the two. When the contrast is lower, it might hide more. So it really depends on what you're working on. And sometimes you have to play with that stuff. And unfortunately, it does mean doing some swatch tests and stuff like that. But yeah, it is something worthwhile. Um, Maureen says, going to take notes on the replay running night. Thank you very much. Well, hopefully you uh, get something good out of that. Uh, we have some other stuff here. Alisa says, love the term sacrificial fill. Yeah, any guideline you need, draw the guidelines you need, throw a fill down so that you can have a measurement of, of exact uh, densities. Hey, if you're working toward a density that's not four points, then why not put down a fill of the density you want to work towards? You're working towards half density? Yeah, why not? Um, so that's something we have to do. But like I said, that's one of those things that's different. Uh, Yvette says, can you share the slides, the density of the fills? Uh, that slide just showed ratios on it. I can just put, put it up for you again, but I'm going to tell you this uh, doesn't tell you fill densities. It's about ratios. Uh, all it means is in a distributed linear, linear gradient like this, when you have the two colors, you can evenly divide the steps that you need. In this case, th that's that four layer, a quarter density. We'll do another show on that. But if you want, you want that slide, it'll help. That's not the gradient spacings. It's not specific settings in your software. It's about layering things together. So we'll get back to that for sure. We'll do another piece about that. But yeah, it's one of those things that we'll have to work with. So yeah, Yvette says, great info on curved fills. Can we try it? Love it. Love it very much. It's uh, Curved fills are my favorite. I just really like them. There are problems with them if you curve them too hard, but really they do add a lot of lovely texture. Jorita says, on a larger design, could you make the turquoise runs on the neck a backstitch? Sure. Um, backstitches are awesome. The thing to watch out for backstitches is that they have an angled return. So if you're trying to make them fall in line or sink down into an existing fill, um, a backstitch is going to take different angles and they're going to stand up high. Now, if you want extra thickness, backstitches are great. Uh, did an entire article in Images Magazine about line defining stitch types. You might want to check that one out. Uh, wonderful piece. I can't tell you where it is right now, uh, but it is there back a ways. Joe Rita says, Chavez Firewood blend is so much better than other experts I've watched. Well, thank you. Uh, the Chavez Firewood, that's a, once again, labor of love. Some of those things are very difficult to do. So we'll talk about blending again. I think gradients is coming up. It's something that we always talk about, but something I think I'm going to go over in detail again. Uh, Jesse says, hi. Hi, Jesse. Happy to have you in. Yvette says, great information. Thank you very much, Yvette. Thank you for being there. And um, Caffrey says, uh, very informative session. Thank you, Marta, th for being here. But suffice it to say, with that, I'm going to go ahead and let that be enough. Whole hour and a half on this stuff. I know I went over and over, but I think sometimes looking at someone's constructed designs can really help. And watching them run can help you kind of figure out your own construction. Just think about how things are built. Play it out in your head as you're planning it. You can always change it. But this is something that I taught in my most recent sessions. Uh, the digitizer's eye, the eye for embroidery, your ability to envision a design needs to do two big things. It needs to think ahead and beyond. What does that mean? When we're working on our design, we have to think in the process ahead of ourselves from the base layer that we're building to the end from the beginning of the design to the end in sequence. That's thinking ahead. And then we have to think beyond. When we're looking at art that's in front of us, we have to know that the embroidered result won't be exactly the same as the print art that's in front of us. And we have to be able to picture what it's going to look like and think about shapes and textures that aren't in the original art that makes sense for the embroidery. So think ahead of ourselves in the process and beyond the art that's in front of us into something more. All right, folks. So with that, work on that eye for embroidery, layer some stitches together and, you know, make some room for the things that are coming along later. All right, folks. Happy to have you here and can't wait to do it again next week.